Good morning. My talk is about the Human Connectome Project, which will transform the way we relate brain circuits to human behavior. Let's start with some big questions. What makes us think and love and play chess? What makes us tick? Why do we all behave so differently? What makes us unique as a species and as individuals? Well, it's all in the connections, the wiring of the brain, the physical wires, and the strength of connections. If we take a quick look at the parts lits inside our skull, we have a brain with several pounds of squishy tissue. It contains about 90 billion neurons all told. The dominant structure is the cerebral cortex, which I'll focus upon because it's the component that endows us with our uniquely human characteristics. I'll say only a little about the other two major components, the cerebellum and the many subcortical nuclei, though they're also very important. Two decades ago, I was in my last of 16 wonderful years on the faculty at Caltech, and Dan Fellman and I at that time published a map of several dozen visual areas in the cerebral cortex of the macaque monkey. We also reported that there were hundreds of pathways linking these visual areas in a hierarchical diagram you see in the center and in a two-dimensional connectivity matrix you see on the right. Now, we and others bemoaned at the time that there was no comparable base of information about human brain circuits. What we didn't realize was that in the ensuing two decades, magnetic resonance imaging, or MRI, would bring forth an explosion of new methods and vast amounts of information about human brain structure, function, and connectivity that would let us talk seriously, as we now will, about the human connectome. So a connectome is a comprehensive map of neural connections. I'll talk about the human macroconnectome, which is mapping the long-distance connections between one patch of gray matter and another down to the resolution afforded by the imaging methods, which is about one to two millimeters in spatial dimensions. You'll hear later from Jeff Lichtman about an equally exciting effort to build up from the bottom an understanding of the location of every neuron, synapse, axon, and dendrite in small patches of tissue, but it's a challenge to get that up to even the level of one millimeter. So I'll give you an overview of the Human Connectome Project, talk a little bit more about basic brain anatomy, focus on functional connectivity, and give you an idea of how we explore intriguing aspects of individual variability. Two years ago, the NIH awarded two grants under the umbrella of the Human Connectome Project. I'm going to talk about the efforts of the consortium led by Washington University and Minnesota. And what we're doing is to study brain circuits in 1,200 healthy adults drawn from a pool of twins and their non-twin siblings. And we're using cutting-edge imaging methods. I'll only have time to talk about one of them, resting state functional MRI, or fMRI, that lets us explore functional connectivity. We're not hoarding these data as we acquire. We've already made some of the data publicly freely available. And we're providing an informatics platform that will allow for powerful data mining and visualization. We want this to be a resource for discovery science and a baseline for leading to better treatment and handling of many brain disorders that you heard about from Tom Ensel. Back to basic neuroanatomy, this is one high resolution structural MRI slice through one of our human connectome project subjects. You can see the outer rim of cortical gray matter in its very complex convolutions that surround the core of subcortical white matter. We can capture the shape of the cortical folds, the convolutions, by one surface in dark blue that runs around the outer or peel surface of the cortex, and another in light green that runs along the boundary between gray and white matter. And we can capture it throughout the entire left and right hemispheres uh, in this slab you see a portion of the whole brain. 
we can take this and turn it into a surface model and take a spin around from the lateral to the medial aspects of the right hemisphere. And you can see the deep crevasses of some of the folds and some of the smaller wrinkles and crevasses. And we can smooth out these convolutions. And you can see an inflated map now in which the representation of shape is preserved in that darker streaks represent regions that were deeper in the original folded brain. We'll use left and right hemisphere surface maps like you see on the left, combined with volume slices like you see on the right to visualize and analyze functional MRI. And we now turn our attention to that. Here you see one moment in the life of one of our Human Connectome Project subjects. This is the blood oxygenation level dependent or bold signal in that subject for one moment. And we know that that signal is a reflection of recent neural activity. So the regions that are yellow and red are patches of the cortex that were a little more active than average. And the green and blue regions were a little less active at this moment. And the same is true for the cerebellum and subcortical structures you can see on the right, as well as the cortical uh, ribbon views that you see also on the right now. So let's, before we turn this into a movie, uh, I want you to enjoy the big picture of the pattern that will emerge, but also pay some attention to patches one and two, which start out a little bit hot, and patches three and four, which start out a little bit more quiescent. Now we turn on the movie, grab your popcorn bag and enjoy, and you can see that patch three, for example, which started out cool, is now a little bit hotter, and other changes occur at throughout the entire cortex. And what you're, we're actually watching is the exquisite spatial and temporal orchestration of the brain's symphony that goes on inside your skull 24-7, even while you're asleep. And our ability to view what's going on has benefited greatly from the uh, higher data quality that our advances in methodology have provided from the Connectome Project and better visualization methods as well. So what we're going to do in just a moment is go beyond looking at pretty pictures and see how we analyze uh, this uh, brain symphony by looking at correlations uh, locally between different brain locations. So we'll do that by taking the time course of the bold signal that you saw the movie of, but now over an entire hours period, and we look at fluctuations at location one and ask uh, at location two, are the two going in correspondence or in anti-correlation or somewhere in between? And we can do that for the full hour-long data set for each pair of points out of 90,000 patches of gray matter, and we get what we call a functional connectivity matrix. We can explore this 30 gigabyte chunk of data from each subject by reading out maps of functional connectivity for different brain locations. So here you see what we call a seed location in the right parietal cortex, and the yellow and red regions are functionally correlated with the seed location. If we choose a different seed location in the central socus, we see a very different pattern. We can do this wherever we're interested in looking at functional connectivity. So in the next slide, you see a location in lateral left hemisphere cortex in an individual subject. And we see that the functional connectivity is a complex pattern in local and long distance correlations that are part of what other studies have shown to be a network that is activated in a wide variety of cognitive tasks. We can do this not just in one subject, but here you're looking on the right at the average from 25 subjects. And uh, we can uh, see that the signal is stronger, but it's also spatially blurred. So we're now in a position to ask, does network organization vary with the subject's intelligence, with their working memory performance, or with other characteristics that we acquire from all of these subjects? We can do this for a different brain location, a little more posterior in the angular gyrus. And again, we see a connectivity map, but now it's very different. The regions that had been hotspots in the preceding slide are now uh, low correlation, and instead we see strong correlations with regions that are known from other studies to be part of what we call a default mode network, a network that is actually more active 
at rest when one is introspecting and less so when one is doing specific tasks. When we look at the average uh, functional connectivity map on the right, we see it's once again blurred, and now we ask why. Well, that's because the me methods that we currently use to align across subjects rely on commonalities in cortical folding patterns, but as we'll now see, these cortical folding patterns are highly variable across subjects. So here we see four hemispheres, and they are taken from two pairs of identical twins. And on the right, you look at a what we call a cortical brain print, the cortical folding pattern on an inflated map. And I'll just tell you that the top two are from one pair of identical twins, the bottom two from another pair of identical twins. If you had time to analyze it very carefully, you'd see that the, the twins are slightly more similar in shape than unrelated individuals, but you are really struck more by the differences in folding patterns. And what we learn, bottom line, is that cortical folding is highly variable, but only modestly heritable. Another challenge is that the cortical areas whose function and connectivity we wish to analyze and better understand, these areas are not perfectly aligned with cortical folding patterns. So we need better methods. We need an improved way to align across subjects. We have several emerging methods in our toolkit. I'll tell you about one of them that relies on what we call myelin maps. So here you see a uh, slice, horizontal slice through the brain of a structural image of the type that I showed you before. White matter is bright. The gray matter is varying shades of gray. The next image here is a slice, the same subject, same slice level, but a different imaging modality that has the white matter dark, and the gray matter is, again, shades of gray. My student, Matt Glasser, had the idea of taking the ratio of these and showing that the first intensity values divided by the second slice gives a heat map here that, where the red spots are high ratio, and they correspond to heavily myelinated regions. If we look at the hot spot down in the bottom of the left, we see a visual area MT that's known to be a hot spot of functional uh, of motion processing. And in that subject, if we look at the functional connectivity map of, across the hemispheres, we see hot spots of functional connectivity that co-localize with hot spots of myelin. So this gives us a very encouraging and exciting way to explore brain circuits uh, using multiple modalities. So in more broadly, we can use functional connectivity to compare across individuals, across imaging modalities, compare with behavior, as I alluded to, compare with genotyping data that we'll be analyzing in two years. And altogether, the Human Connectome Project is going to elucidate brain connectivity and its variability and will give us uh, many insights. But we should also realize that we're not going to get a complete micro and macro connectome of the human brain, at least in my lifetime. We should be optimistic that even though there are limitations to each of these methods, that the diagnosis and treatment of the many brain disorders that you heard about from Tom Insel will be better treated and analyzed by the advances that we're seeing uh, emerging from the Human Connectome Project and related efforts. So I've had the great pleasure of working with a fantastic team of more than 100 dedicated investigators and uh, um, team members associated with the Human Connectome Project. I don't have time to do more than mention the names of two of them. One, the co-principal investigator Camille Ugerbill from University of Minnesota, and also my very talented graduate student Matt Glassers, whose work I had a chance to highlight here. So to wrap it up and take a high-level view, put it into context, we've seen a number of revolutions in cartography of the Earth's surface and of the brain. It started with classical maps of the Earth's surface and of the brain. One big transformation was the emergence of atlases, book atlases that provided a compendium brought into many types of data brought into a common framework. A huge transformation occurred when powerful imaging methods gave us satellite images of the Earth's surfaces and MRI-based images of brain structure and function. We all know about the transformative effect of Google, effect, Google Earth and Google Maps and our navigation of the world around us. 
And we're, at least I'm optimistic that the connectomic explosion that you're starting to see hints of is going to give us deep insights into human brain disorders and uh, brain understanding in uh, health and disease. So thank you for your attention.